Wow, what a great, great week it's been. Don Moen concert yesterday was phenomenal. It was just very awesome. Let's stand. And we, uh, I'm going to, today our focus is on the garden tomb. And I'm going to keep that as a, as a theme this morning. And I, I just want to really impress on you. I'm going to put some slides back again later on. There's something very exciting that I really want you to get this morning from our trip. And this part is, is, will stay with me forever. So um, this is a beautiful message, OK? Let's, let's, let's open our uh, Bibles to John chapter 20. And just for those who may be new and have never read this, we'll start reading from verse 6. And so Simon Peter also came following John. And entering the tomb, he saw the linen wrappings lying there. Very interesting word, lying there. But the face cloth of the napkin, which had been on Jesus' head, was not lying with the linen wrappings. What was rolled up or folded, as many translations say, in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb, that's John, then also entered, and he saw, and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that Jesus must arise from the dead. What scripture was that? Many. We could talk about Isaiah 53. We could talk about Psalm 16, verse 10. That will not keep the Holy One in the grave or allow his flesh to suffer decay. You could talk about uh, uh, he will see, he will die, Isaiah 53, but then he will rise and justify many. My servant will be lifted up. We could talk about his second coming. So the disciples went away again to their own house, but homes, but Mary was standing outside of the tomb weeping, and so she wept and she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting one at their head, one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they've taken away my Lord. I don't know where they have laid him. When she said this, they, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, because this was a garden. She said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. Why did Mary recognize Jesus the same moment? Many reasons for that. We'll give several in the message. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means not rabbi, but not teacher, but my teacher, my esteemed teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. That evening, Jesus said, Thomas, you can touch me. But right now in the morning, Mary, don't touch me. Why? There was a great reason for that, amazing reason for that. Don't touch me. Stop clinging to me. But touch me in the evening and put your hands in my side. Thomas, you can do that. Then one more scripture in Mark 16. I think this is kind of interesting if you read it. Because it isn't Mary Magdalene who looks to the right. It is the other women who come to the tomb. In Mark 16, verse 5, and this is a great scripture. This just comes alive. Mark 16 and verse 5. Very early, verse 2. On the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. I found out the sun rises very early in Israel. I'm very light sensitive. And uh, the sun rises 4 o'clock. 4.30, 5 in the morning. 
So very early, before the sun rises, we usually think of six o'clock in the morning is when Jesus rose. How do you know that? Uh, Justin told me at six o'clock in the morning. I asked him, how do you know that? Justin didn't, I'm just teasing. <laughs> very early on the first day, on the first week, they came to the tomb where the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When you roll the stone down, because they put channels for the stone, it would only take two people to roll the stone down. But because you've got to push the stone up the channel, two tons, it would now take 10 people to roll it up. Who will roll the stone away for us? Entering the tomb, they saw a young man. Looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right Notice that, sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. An angel. Okay, Father, we thank you this morning. Bless the word to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want you to think with me, if we could, if we could have the slide up, please, <clears throat> just for a moment. This is going to be a kind of different message. <clears throat> Okay, and just hold the slide, yeah? Okay, so. All right, can we hold it? Okay, all we know that the Bible says in the scriptures about Jesus is that he was taken outside the city gates, number one. He was taken to a hill outside the city gates. We also told it was not obviously in a very isolated place because people passed by the road and mocked him. It was called a place called Golgotha, which means in Hebrew, the skull or Calvary, in the Greek, the skull. Uh, we've, the, the, many years ago, a British explorer was looking out of his house and noticed this hill on the other side from the traditional site and said that it looks just like a skull. They excavated, they went down, and lo and behold, they found this incredible garden tomb around, garden around this place. And they found out that this was the garden of a very rich man. That's why the vineyards, the vine press, a cistern, Israel is very dry and uh, you don't have a lot of gardens all over. And so they would have cisterns to collect the water. This man had a beautiful garden. And therefore the cisterns with millions of gallons of water that could be stored underground. And just right next to the skull, you have the skull on one side and 50 meters away. It was getting to Sabbath, Joseph of Arithmetia, had prepared a tomb in the garden. The Bible says it was not a normal cave like Israelites normally bury people. They find the, latest, the, the nearest cave in the mountains to bury their dead. Joseph had made this tomb uh, for his family. It was a tomb that was hewn out of stone. It was hewn into the rock. This was a wealthy man who had done this. And the way the tomb was is very different from the normal graves, that are just very plain. This man had taken a lot of structure in the tomb. What an awesome thing. And so you go down from Golgotha Hill, where Jesus cries, it is finished, and you have this garden tomb. Very beautiful. Now, what do you see this? The place of the skull. Bus stop on the side right now. And then we go to the garden tomb. OK, yeah, just keep going. All right, this is the tomb. Can you hold for a moment? And we're standing outside this tomb. It's so beautiful. It's awesome. And now I want to show you, man, these slides really don't listen to you, Shalom. <laughs> no, that's fine. Just, just. Okay, so anyway, Joseph of Arithmetic. Let me give you some history in the meantime, yeah? Where is Arithmetia? It's far away from Israel. Joseph is a believer. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. He's a rich man. Uh, 
Josephus in history tells us that Joseph was actually a tin trader. We don't know for sure, but he was the, one of the third or fourth richest man in Israel. This man who was part of the Sanhedrin became a believer in Jesus Christ. And so he decides to give because it's Sabbath and they got to bury him quickly. He puts Jesus in his own family grave, never used again. Think about this. So we're standing outside here. Here is the channel in which the stone would be rolled, okay? And this very large two-ton stone. Now let's, let's go to the next slide, if we would. The wine press, yeah, forget that. The water cistern, yeah, all right, great. The stone rolled in this channel, okay. Now think with me, all right? Just hold for a moment. Jesus, <coughs> okay, forget the slides, just look at me now, all right? Think with me. Mary Magdalene. In a garden long time ago, in Eden, Adam committed the first sin. It was in another garden that Jesus, the last Adam, would come on this earth and get his victory. Paradise lost in the garden of Eden. Paradise won for man in a garden tomb. But Mary doesn't know that. On that Sunday early morning, her heart is very heavy. Here's a woman who has had seven demons cast out of her. And we went to Magdala. And you can imagine this woman with seven demons has been tormented and Jesus, her friend, her savior, her Lord, has cast those demons out. He has given a hope, he's given a compassion, he's, he's given a dignity, worth. And now all of that is crushed under the Roman boots and the dictator of the Roman army. Mary comes to the tomb and she's a woman without hope. Think with me for a moment. Jesus. And, and she comes to the tomb and the first thing she sees is that this big stone has been violated. There's no Roman gods anymore. There's nothing there. And so Mary does, and I love what the Bible says. She goes and she runs all the way back. We found out, I always had the impression that the upper room or where the disciples would be would be right close to where they were buried, Jesus. It wasn't. It was three miles away. It was on the other side of the city where Jesus was tried by Caiaphas' home. So she would run all the way back to tell the disciples. And then Peter and John would run all the way back to the tomb early in the morning. In their minds, they're thinking, who's taken the body? Is it the Romans? Why would they do that? Is it the Jews? Do they want to throw him as a criminal in the garden in, in Gehenna Valley where the criminals are burnt? Is it the Romans? And for what reason would that happen? And Peter and John go to the tomb, and we know the story. John's a faster runner. He gets there first. And he goes to the tomb, he looks in, and then he comes out. But Peter, the more bold one, goes in. And the Bible says, I love this beautiful thing. And the Bible says, and they saw the linen garments lying there, all wrapped up. The Bible doesn't say it was just lying there. The Bible says that they were all wrapped up as if there was a body. The Greek brings out, were lying in its folds. But the napkin that covered Jesus' face was by itself laying <coughs> aside. What a story. What an amazing thing. Now one of the most beautiful things if we could just go in and see the tomb again is this. The tomb that we saw was obviously a rich man's tomb. It was built in a particular structure that was different from normal structures. And as you enter the tomb, you'd enter this, this entrance here and the first chamber would be a weeping chamber. Do you remember the Bible says that Peter, John, and then there was others that went and the other women went to the tomb. Well, if it was a small tomb like regular, how could few people go in? That was very interesting. The Bible says the women went in after Mary Magdalene had left, and they looked and they saw, they looked to the right. Now in this particular tomb, the weeping chambers you entered, and then you actually took the burial spot, and this is where a body of somebody was laid. And when they would use the tomb, they would actually cut into the stones a pillow. 
And so there was a pillow there, and where the legs were, they would cut a place there for the legs. On this side, we saw another ledge, which was incomplete. Obviously, the tomb had not been used after that. The Jews would normally keep a body for the first burial, which was wrapped in linen clothes, and after the body decomposed, after some time, they would then take, collect the bones and put it in an ossuary. Well, Jesus' body was laid right here. What was very interesting, and the guy brought this out very beautifully, is the Bible says, entering the tomb, they looked in and saw a young man in a long white robe sitting on the right side. That's interesting. Now, you never know why it was written on the right side if you entered it until you went there. But as we enter the tomb, you have to look to the right to see where the body of Jesus had been laid. And I thought in that moment, that was awesome. You got a skull hill, you got a beautiful garden, you got a tomb. You enter in and you have to look at the right. I'm not saying that's the place of Jesus, where Jesus was, but we believe it's most likely where our Lord was placed. And even if it wasn't, who cares? He's risen. <laughs> and that's so important for us. Now, what do you see something, okay? We're through with this. Uh, we can just put the next place there. This was what it really looked like. No, the, the, the picture. No, 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 right in the back. Oh, okay, that's, that's literally the actual site. And now imagine the one angel's here, and one angel is over here, okay? And do you notice one of, if you read the Gospels when you go home, you'll see that when the women looked for us, they saw only one angel, because there's a big cleft here. It's right here. But then afterwards it says, two angels step out to talk to them. Now think with me for a moment. Guess what? Imagine if the linen wrappings of Jesus is all here, but there's no body inside. The face cloth is laying by itself on one side, and there's two angels on this side. You know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of the Old Testament, where there was an ark, and the angels were looking in the Old Testament upon the blood that was sprinkled on the mercy seat. Well, when Mary went to the tomb, she saw the two angels on either side of this beautiful, beautiful uh, linen garments that were there, two angels, and they're both looking on, because this too is a holy place. Do you understand that? A woman with demon possession is now standing in a place that is the holy place where God is speaking. I love it tonight. If we could look at the scriptures all afresh, and it says that Peter went out of the tomb, and they marveled, for they did not yet understand the scriptures. Oh, I love the Bible. I love the scriptures. Everything in the scriptures is real. We came back and we just realized everything in the scriptures is so real. If we could just show a few slides. I want to show you a few slides. And I want to show you that this, we've talked about this aspect before, but I want to bring it up again. I want to show you the tabernacle, and I want to show you the glory of John's gospel. I want to show you that again, if we could just quickly do that. In the Old Testament, we have a tabernacle. The tabernacle in the Old Testament spoke of how a believer, a Jewish believer, could approach God's throne. It had to happen through sacrifice, a place of sacrifice. And if you looked at the furniture in this tabernacle, there were many parts of the furniture. In the outer court, there was this outer court, and this is the inner court. We could actually see that. The brazen altar, this is where the lambs were slain to be killed, and the Jewish people would bring the lambs and slay them. And then the priests would go and wash their hands and their feet uh, in the labor, the brazen labor, because only after they could wash themselves and were pure could they enter into the holy place to have fellowship with God. And so they would do that. And in the holy place, uh, I forgot my, my little pen today, but I'm just going to go with it. Uh, in the holy place, there would be a candle stand which spoke of Jesus, the light of the world, the showbread which spoke of uh, 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 the, the bread of heaven, the bread of God's presence, and the altar of incense, 
right before the Holy of Holies, which spoke of prayer ascending to heaven. And then in the Holy of Holies, as we've taught you, there was the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat with the angels looking on. And this was a beautiful picture of our approach to God. Well, look at the way John's Gospel is presented. Are you listening? John's Gospel amazingly presented, inspired by the Holy Spirit. If you read John's Gospel, you know how it starts? This is how it starts. John's Gospel, a mini tabernacle. John chapter 1 verse 14. This is how it starts. And the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. John's giving us the big picture of the tabernacle. Then John chapter, then John between John chapter 3 and John chapter 12, John is now going to take us into, if we can go to the, yeah, okay, John's going to take, just keep it right here, John's going to take us in John chapter 1 verse 29, he takes us to the outermost furniture, the brazen altar, it had to come first, in John 1 29, we hear John the Baptist saying, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the lamb that is to be slain on the brazen altar. And I believe that while all the furniture of the holy place and the holy of holies is really a replica of what is in heaven, the brazen altar speaks of that which is on earth, the outer court, and that's the cross. And behold the lamb of God who's going to take away the sins of the world, carry them away. And then in John chapter 4, verse 14, Jesus says to the woman in Samaria, He says, I am the labor. I am the water. I give you water to drink. You will not thirst again. In John chapter 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. There's the show bread. And He says that. Jesus says that. Listen carefully. Because in the tabernacle, you'd have how many pieces of bread? Good. Twelve. Twelve representing who? Twelve tribes of Israel. Well, when Jesus performed the miracle, the first miracle, how many baskets of loaves were left behind? Twelve. Jesus saying, I am the bread of life, Israel. And then in John chapter 8, verse 12, when he heals the blind man, that's the candle stand. I am the light of the world. <coughs> John's Gospel, the brazen altar, the bread of life, the candlestick. Well, where is the altar of incense? In John chapter 15 and 16, Jesus is moving us to the altar of incense. First he says, he talks about the Holy Spirit. Then he talks, that's the olive oil that was in the candlesticks. Then he talks about bread and fruit bearing, and that was the lampstands with the almonds on them, resurrection life. And then John 17, the high priest himself is praying, Father, glorify me with the glory that I have with you before the time was. The high priest himself is praying at the altar of incense before he goes in to present his blood on the Holy of Holies. And then where is the Holy of Holies? That is John 19, 31. It is finished. It is finished. And John 20, when Mary goes in the tomb and she sees the blood sprinkled on the mercy seat here that was eventually going to be taken to heaven. And, and Jesus, Mary goes to Jesus and says, uh, she wants to cling to him. And he says, Mary, stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Now, you say, why did Mary, why did Jesus say to Mary, stop touching me, stop touching me? Uh, in the evening, he says to Thomas, now touch my hands and touch my feet. And no, it is not the spirit of the life. Why did he say that? One of the explanations that's given, that's not such a good explanation, but it's an explanation. One of the reasons is the two Greek words. One word is stop touching me. When he says to Thomas, touch my hands, he was actually saying, touch me, just touch me. Touching on the skin, just touching. So when I touch, touch my, uh, that's just a touch. But when he uses the word for Mary, he uses the word stop clinging to me. For I've not ascended the Father. Well, that's a good explanation, but it's not the best. The proper explanation is he was our high priest. And the high priest, when he sacrificed in the Holy of Holies, had to take the blood straight to heaven to present it before the heavenly holy of holies. And the high priest could not be stopped 
before he presented the blood before his father. And so on Sunday morning when Jesus rose, and Mary was the first person who actually saw him and could actually touch him, Jesus was saying, Mary, don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go tell our brothers, go tell all these people here, go tell the people in India, go tell them that I ascend to my father and your father and my God and your God. That morning, Jesus rose. And they saw the linen garments. And those linen garments at first brought despair. What have they done with him? But later on, when they understood the scriptures and the promises of God, those very linen garments became a symbol of great victory. My friends, I want to say this morning today, those linen garments became a symbol of victory. The very thing they feared became a symbol of victory. The linen garments, somebody said, that was not a good topic to talk about. Nobody likes to talk about dead clothes, the grave clothes. Nobody likes to talk about uh, the, the things you're going to be buried in. How many of you have a discussion about what am I going to be buried in when I'm dying? We don't talk about that. Those were not good subjects. That's a not good subject to talk about. But Jesus that day on, on resurrection morning, on resurrection morning, those linen garments became a symbol of our hope. In the Old Testament, when Jacob was in uh, Jacob uh, asked, where is my son, Joseph? They took the garments and they said, he's dead. Here's another father, a garment. But actually the truth of the matter was that Joseph was not dead. And later on when they saw the multicolored coat, they would say, I remember the coat. But actually, God had done wonderful things through Joseph's life. Uh, let me say this to you. Two fathers looked at garments, but that was not the full story. The Bible says, if God is for us, then who can be against us? Because God makes all things work together for good to those who love him. Uh, sometimes in our lives we have trials and sometimes in our lives we have tests and the situation doesn't look good by sight and you think about it for the disciples and just as application uh, the, the disciples it didn't seem like everything was going to be okay it just was such a hard hard day and my point to you is is what happens on Friday when you're standing in a tragedy and you say God I'm going to go through Friday and I'm going to go to Saturday because I don't even know when the disciples came to Sunday morning. They were not expecting Sunday morning, and yet they were faithful. Think with me. In our lives, we'll have trials. And you can actually say, you know what? I just got diagnosed one day. You say, I got diagnosed with cancer. Or I had a court case. Or my business is having major problems, and I don't know. It just seems that it's just such a hard season for me in my life. But God says, I'll take the trial. And even though it doesn't look good, I'll turn it around into something very profitable. I'll bring in through the trial humility. I'll bring in through the trial brokenness. I'll bring in through the trial of dependency on me. That when the trial's over, and you can look at the trial, you can say, I've got the scars of what happened. But actually, that trial was for my glory. Have you not experienced that? I remember a story of a young man, his name was Juan Pablos, and he was in El Salvador, and he was a pastor, a missionary. And as he was as he was preaching and planting churches, the El Salvador guerrillas took him and one day because they didn't they didn't they everybody who was against their movement they would go against. And one day he found himself in a car and they had set fire to his car. 
And Yuan Pablos, the missionary pastor, found himself in a car that was burning. And he, he escaped out of the car, but he had tremendous burns on his hands, his face. And it was tremendous. And he thought to himself, I'll never pastor again. I'll never be a missionary. I can't do it with the scars on my hand. And he just thought, this is it. But then the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, Jesus spoke to him and said, they did the same to me. And I'm going to use you for a greater purpose. And the same man, courageous man, decided to go back and pastor today in El Salvador. He's got a great ministry. And those scars in his hand don't mean anything to him because he identifies with the fellowship of Jesus. And sometimes, friends, God allows this to happen. And I'm just thinking of this way. What an awesome thing. Just God allows little storms to happen. Little, I love what Don Moan said yesterday. There's three classes of people, I should tell this. Three classes of people on this earth. He said, number one, those who are about to go into a storm. Number two, those who are in a storm. And number three, those who have just come out of a storm. And he said, the other ones who have to smile on their face because they are just so happy they came out of a storm. But life is that way. And you have your storms, and you have your you have your tr tests and your traumas and job terminations and tumors and whatever life throws at you. You don't want to be pessimistic about it, but that's what life is sometimes all about. But thank you, God, we have a resurrection. We have a hope. One last thing, I'll close. Why did Jesus go to a Jewish woman like Mary? Actually, that's how I know the Bible's authentic. You see, a Jewish woman's testimony would amount to nothing. If I had to rewrite the Bible of the resurrection account, I would actually put in five witnesses of Jewish men. <laughs> Sorry, woman. It just happened to be the day. But Jesus doesn't. The Bible, the Holy Spirit writes it as it happens goes to a woman called Mary Magdalene. Jesus could have risen. I can think of many things he could do. One of them is knock on Pilate's door and say, see, I told you I'm the throat. <laughs> or Caiaphas' home and say, I told you I'm coming back as the Son of God. He did. He went to a woman who had no hope. This morning, that's the power of our God. I was thinking, what an awesome God we have. I mean, the creator of heaven and earth, all creation. And then he leaves us tomb empty. And he leaves the napkin folded. Did you get that? Did you get that? To fold a napkin means I'm coming back. If you finished your meal and you just left the napkin on the table, the servant would know, all right, he's done with the meal. Let's clear the table. But to fold the napkin and keep it in place in Jewish custom meant, don't clear the table. I'm just away for a little while, and I'm coming back. Well, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Let's just bow for prayer. Lord, we love you this morning. Thank you for an empty tomb. Thank you, God, for that tomb. What people see, what we hear about, we don't have to visit the garden tomb to believe. We believe because your word says the scriptures because we understand those scriptures. And this morning, your tomb tells us, yes, you are risen with power. You're alive and you love to have a relationship with us. God, Christ, Jesus, you're in our midst. As you were with Mary in the garden early that morning, as you were with the disciples 
as you appeared to them and disappeared in a moment. Lazarus had to be unwrapped, but Christ didn't. Because Lazarus rose up in a resuscitated body, but Jesus rose in a resurrection body. A resurrection body doesn't have to be unwrapped. That's why Christ could just leave his garments behind. And those garments are a testimony of a Savior we love, a Savior is in heaven, a Savior who listens to our prayers. And my friends, I want to take the next 10 minutes just to minister. We're going to have some songs and praise and some worship just for minutes. You stay where right where you are. We're going to sing some songs this morning because I just feel like this is what God would have us do. And I want you to think about your fears this morning. Maybe it's about retirement. Maybe it's about your job. Maybe it's about your health issues. I just want to tell you, Jesus Christ tonight is Lord of heaven and earth. He rose from that grave. That where is thy sting? In grave where is thy victory? And they looked on the right and they saw uh, there was an angel there. And the angels were at the tomb. And the angels were looking on the blood. And the angels accompanied Jesus to heaven. And the angel is singing tonight about the blood that's in heaven. And tonight we have a victory because his God is our God. And his Father is our Father. And we have tonight, we can say with prayer and with praise. And we can say with authority, little words like, my Father, my Father. And he listens to us because his Father has become my Father. Oh, thank you, God, tonight. There's power in prayer. My wife and I came away from the tomb and we said, ah, she, she just said to me, now I just feel there's so much more, so much power in prayer. I said, why do you think about prayer, the God of tomb? She says, well, I just, I just connected the two together. We have authority in prayer. Friend, tonight, give it all to Christ. The very thing you don't understand, the very thing that's troubling you, could actually be the very thing that draws you to Him that you'll be praising Him for in 10 years from now. You see so little, but you don't know the providence of God. Pro video to see beforehand. God sees beforehand. He sees the history. He saw the grief of a Jacob weeping for his son. Little did he know that God had a plan for that son. Lord, we love you tonight. Yeah, we're just going to sing some songs. Why don't we stand? We'll sing this song. I am the Lord that healeth thee. We'll pray for bodies today, physical ailments, and the move. Just pray. I want this to be from your heart tonight. Just an expression of praise and thanksgiving. Trusting from the heart. Confessing with the mouth. God, you are who you are. You are who you say you are.
loves us. His word says, I am a healing God. I am the Lord, your healer. So often when we've cried out to him, God can reverse simple things, simple things like blood pressure, problems, stress, just heal you today. Diabetes, problems with the lung, problems with dialysis. Lord, you can do it all tonight. Thank you, Lord. Worship you. We can just just raise your hand if you want to be prayed for this morning. Father, you know the needs of everyone here today. We call unto you from our heart. It's not our words that are important. When you see our faith, you are pleased. We pray in Jesus' name for people this morning that just need a touch of their bodies, Lord. Physical healing. Lord, for pressure, high blood pressure problems in a few cases, and anxiety and stress. Would you heal? Would you show us, Lord, how to victory, have the peace of God that passes understanding, to be released, to trust you more than ever. We pray this morning for Simon and Melody. Lord, I lift up Simon to you. I'm so glad he's in church today. What an awesome believer. He and Melody, Lord, have trusted and loved you. We pray for him, Lord. We pray for his kidneys. We pray for the dialysis treatment. Father, thank you for giving him such a wonderful extension of life. Thank you that his sons, Ezra and Obadiah, grown up and work. You've been so great and loving to the family, Lord. Would you touch him today again? Fresh infusion of Christ's power in his blood. Help of God to be strong in the days to come. And Lord, yes, you can heal him. You can heal him, Lord Jesus. Not our power, but your glory, for your glory's sake, in Christ's name. For anybody else here this morning, for somebody with depression, Lord, heal. Release us to know that there's victory in Christ, hope in Jesus, comfort, encouragement every day in his presence. Oh God, you love us so much. You love us. We're the apple of your eye. We're surrounded by your presence. We're the children of your care. We're adopted. We're called by your name. We're seated above in heavenly places. Who are royal priests and kings. Lord, we are yours. We belong to you. You write our names in the palm of your hand. You bottle our tears. You know everything about us. I pray today that the spirit of depression, God, whatever's causing that, we just lift. Just strengthen this one person I'm thinking of so much. Bless them, heal them completely. Bless them tonight. For marriages today, this morning we pray for his restoration and blessing and intimacy. We pray that husbands Spirit-filled, we lay down their lives for their wives. The wives responding in that beauty, beauty of harmony that Christ has presented us to represent the church. Lord, it's more than our generation that needs to see this love. It's the next and the next generation that needs to see Christ modeled through a church. Lord, there's so much you want to do. Bless businesses today. The creativity of the businessmen. Lord, make plans come to fruition. 
We don't want to waste our time on the earth. Lord, we want you to bless and give your ideas and concepts translated into wonderful business of the kingdom and give us hearts to share the blessing, God, beyond for the missionary work that we do as a church. Lord, help us to live as kingdom servants in everything. We love you. takes our prayers to the Father and says, Father, I believe this is what they really want. And he gives us beyond what we've asked for or thought about. But draw near, because that's when Jesus' Bible says, draw near to him, for he ever lives to make intercession for you. Draw near, so he has something to pray for. Draw near, because Jesus wants to do far more than you have experienced thus far. Draw near, because even though the plan has been wonderful, the best is yet to come. 
draw near because Jesus is returning back. And boy, we're going to see the King coming back in glory soon one day. The best is yet to come. Draw near because the napkin is folded. And it means just a little while and I'll soon be back to reveal my glory. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you for the house of God. Thank you for the word. Thank you for stirring our hearts this morning. Thank you for the youth that shared from their hearts so beautifully. We pray for every one of them and the others that didn't share yet. Lord, that each one of their lives we deeply minister to in the days to come. Lord, we love you. Bless our missionaries in the fields this morning. We pray. Praise marches, Christmas banquets, all that is due, Lord. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said, Amen. Amen.